following on from the tone that they've set about, about where the standards have to go and what constitutes a good standard, we've got a very exciting cyber, uh, cybersecurity panel on what is cybersecurity in 2015. I want to ask our panelists to come up to the stage. Uh, Edna Conway, the Chief Security Officer for Global Supply Chains from Cisco. Uh, Marianne Mezzapelli, uh, who's the America CTO for Enterprise Security Services at Hewlett Packard. Jim Hytella, our VP of Security. Uh, and Rance DeLong, who's uh, uh, Rance DeLong for the uh, is, uh, Security and High Assurance Systems uh, from Santa Clara University. And uh, I'll introduce myself finally. I'm Dave Lounsbury. I'm the Chief Technical Officer here at the Open Group. So thank you all. So, and as always, uh, we may have time at the end. I'm conscious that, uh, that this is the last panel before lunch. Of course, lunch will be right outside. But uh, please uh, remember, uh, if you have questions, write them on cards. And uh, I'll ask uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Maggie, to uh, run around and uh, collect them. And uh, we'll ask them from up here. So uh, we've heard now about uh, the we've heard all morning about the security, uh, cybersecurity landscape. And uh, of course, everyone knows about all the uh, many recent breaches that were, have been mentioned this morning. Um, and obviously, the challenge is growing in cybersecurity. Uh, so I want to start asking a few questions, and I think uh, what I'll do is start off uh, directing one to Edna, if I may. Um, and uh, we've uh, heard about the, uh, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation, or DBIR, report that talks about um, the uh, catalogs of various attacks that have been made over the past year. And uh, one of the interesting findings was that um, some of these breaches and the attackers were on the networks for uh, months before being discovered. So uh, I'll ask you to start. So what do we need to start doing differently to secure our enterprises? About now, better? Okay. Good. I apologize for sitting at the end of the chair, but it's too big for me. So look, I think there are a couple of things. Um, continuous monitoring, from my perspective, is absolutely essential. Um, people don't like it because it requires rigor, it requires consistency, it requires process. And the real question is, what do you continuously monitor? So I think it's what you monitor that makes a difference. So access control and authentication, absolutely in our, on our radar screen. But I think the real ticket is behavior. So the real question is, what kind of behavior do you see authorized personnel engaging in that should send up an alert? So that's a trend that I think we need to embrace more. And then I think the second thing that we really need to do differently is drive detection and containment. Um, I think we try to do that. I, I think we need to become more rigorous in it. And so some of that rigor is around things like, are we actually doing advanced malware protection rather than just detection? Um, what are we doing specifically around the threat analytics and the feeds that come to us, how we absorb them, how we mine them, um, and how we consolidate them? And then the third thing I think for me is um, how do we get the right, I call that team the puzzle solvers, and how do we get them together swiftly? So how do you put the right group of experts together when you see a behavior aberration or you get a threat feed that says, wait a minute, we need to address this now, so when we see threat injection, we're actually acting on the anomaly before it makes its way further along in the cycle. Any, any reactions? Another thing that I'd like to add is making sure you have the executive um, support and processes in place. If you think how many um, um, plans and tests and other things that organizations have gone through for business continuity and recovery, you have to think about that sort of an incident response too. When we talked about earlier about how do we get the C-suite involved, we need to have that executive sponsorship and understanding and that means it's connected into all of the other parts of the enterprise. So it might be the communications, it might be legal, it might be other things, but it's knowing how to do that and being able to respond to it quickly is also very important. Jim, Lance, any reactions? 
Yeah, I would uh, agree on the monitoring being very important and uh, the question of what to monitor. Uh, there are advances being made uh, through research in this area, both modeling behavior, uh, what are the no nominal behaviors, and how we can allow for certain variations in the behavior and still not have too many false positives or too many false negatives. Also on a technical level, uh, we can analyze systems for certain invariants, uh, and these can be very subtle and complicated invariants, formulas that may be you know, pages long that, uh, that hold on the system during its normal operation, and a, a monitor can be uh, monitoring both for invariance, these static things, but they can also be monitoring for uh, changes that are supposed to occur and whether those are occurring the way they're supposed to. You know, the only thing I would add is that um, I think it's about understanding where you really have risk and being able to measure, you know, how much risk is present uh, in your given situation. I think in the security industry, there's been a, a shift in mindset away from figuring that we can actually prevent every bad thing from happening uh, towards really understanding where, um, you know, people may have gotten into the system, where are those markers that uh, something has gone awry and reacting to, to that in a more timely way. So per, uh, detective controls as opposed to, to purely preventative type controls. Thank you. So Jim, I'm going to leave you with the microphone. Um, we heard from uh, Don Myricks earlier uh, about uh, the convergence of uh, virtual and physical and how that changes uh, the risk management game. Uh, and we heard from uh, Mary Ann D about how she's definitely not going to connect her house to the, uh, inter to the internet. Um, so, uh, so this brings uh, new potential risks and security management concerns. So what do you see as the big IoT security concerns and how does the technology industry assess and respond to those? So uh, the, the and by the way, before I uh, uh, get into my comments, um, that brings to mind there's Marianne and uh, Tony Carrado are giving a presentation this afternoon that is mislabeled on your agendas. Um, it says they'll be talking about business transformation manager profile, which was a shock to them. <laughs> they're, they're in fact going to be talking about securing the Internet of Things, and I, I helped uh, Tony and, and Marianne get some thoughts together on that. Um, in terms of Internet of Things, the, the things that concern me um, are that many of the, the things that we've uh, solved at some level in IT, hardware and software and, and systems um, seem to have been forgotten about in, by many of the Internet of Things uh, device manufacturers. So we've got you know, pretty well uh, thought out processes for how we identify assets, we patch things, we um, uh, deal with uh, uh, security events and vulnerabilities that happen. Um, the idea that, uh, particularly on the consumer class of Internet of Things type devices, uh, we've got devices out there with IP interfaces on them and, and many of the manufacturers just haven't had a thought of how they're going to patch something in the field, uh, I think should scare us all to some degree. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it is, as Marianne mentioned, um, the idea that th there are certain systemic risks uh, that are out there that we just have to sort of nod our head and say, well, that, that's the way it is. But uh, certainly around really critical kinds of Internet of Things applications, I think we need to take what we've learned in the last 10 years and apply it to this new class of devices. Yeah, I'd like to add to that uh, that we need a new architectural approach for Internet of Things that will help to mitigate uh, the systemic risks and uh, echoing uh, the ex uh, concerns expressed by Marianne a few minutes ago, uh, in 2014, Europol, which is an organization that tracks uh, risks of various kinds, uh, criminal risks, uh, predicted that by the end of 2014, it didn't happen, but they predicted uh, murder by internet uh, in the context of internet of things. And I think it's not far-fetched that uh, we may be in overtime. Okay. Would we really know, actually? <laughs> did Mary, did you have any, or Edna, do you have any reaction on that one? The murder by internet? That's the question you give me? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Welcome to being a former prosecutor. The answer is all on their derrieres. Um, the re reality is would we have evid any evidentiary what? reality to be able to prove that? 
Um, I think that the challenge is one that's really well taken, which is we're probably all in agreement, the convergence of these devices, right? We saw the convergence of IT and OT, and we haven't fixed that yet. Um, we're now moving with IoT into a scalability of the nature and volume of devices that to me the real, the real challenge will be to come up with new ways of deploying telemetry to allow us to see all the little crevices and corners of the Internet of Things so that we can identify risks in the same way that we have, while not mastered 100 percent, but certainly tackled predominantly across the computer networks and the network itself and IT. We're just not there with the Internet of Things. I think, Edna, it also brings to mind another thing that we need to take advantage of the technology itself. So as the data gets democratized, meaning it's going to be everywhere, the velocity, volume, and so forth, we need to make sure that those devices can maybe be self-defendable or maybe they can gain together and defend themselves against other things. And so we can't just apply the old world thinking of being able to know everything and control everything, but to embed some of those kinds of, of um, characteristics in the systems and devices and sensors themselves. Um, we heard uh, uh, about the need, in fact, when Ron Ross mentioned the need for uh, increased public-private cooperation to address the cybersecurity threat. And, and uh, Ron, I, I would urge you to think about including voluntary consensus standards organizations in that uh, essential partnership you mentioned to make sure that you get that high level of engagement. But um, of course, this is a, a broad concern to everybody. Um, you know, President Obama has made a call for legislation on enabling cybersecurity and information sharing. And one of the points within that was uh, uh, shaping a cyber savvy workforce. Um, and uh, many other parts of this as well, public private information sharing. So, um, you know, what more can be done to uh, enable effective public private cooperation on this? And, uh, you know, what steps can, can we as a consensus organization take to actually help make that happen. So, uh, Marianne, you want to tackle that one and we'll see where it goes? Yeah, t to your point, collaboration is important, and it's not just about the public and the private partnership. It also means within an industry sector or in your supply chain and third party. It's not just about the technology, it's also about the processes and being able to communicate effectively almost at machine speed along those areas. So you think about uh, the people, the processes, and the technology. I don't think it's going to be solved by government. I think uh, I agree with the, the previous speakers when they were talking about it needs to be more hand in hand. And so I think there are some ways that industry can actually lead that. We've got some examples, for instance, of what we're doing with the healthcare forum and with the mining and minerals forums. That, that might seem like, you know, a little bit, but it's that little bit that helps, that make, brings it together to makes it, make it one more, you know, you know, easier for that connection. And I think it's also important to think about, especially with the, the class of services and products that are available as a service, that's another measure of collaboration. If you as a security organization determine that your capabilities, you really can't keep up with the bad guys. They have more money, more time, more um, opportunity to take advantage either from a financial perspective or maybe even from a competitive perspective for your intellectual property. You really can't do it yourself, so you need those uh, product vendors or you might need a services vendor to really be able to fill in the gaps so that you can have that kind of thing on demand. So I would encourage you to think about that kind of collaboration through partnerships in your whole ecosystem. I know that um, people in the commercial world don't like uh, a lot of regulation, and uh, but I think government can provide certain minimal standards uh, that must be met, and to raise the floor, and uh, not that companies won't exceed these and uh, use that as a competitive basis, but if minima are set uh, in regulations, then this will. Uh, raise the whole level of discourse. Edna? Um, 
So, you know, we could probably debate over a really big bottle of wine, whether it's regulation or whether it's collaboration. I, I, I probably agree with Marianne. Um, I, I think we need to sit down and, and say, what, is the, what are the biggest challenges that we have? And take bold, hairy steps to pull together industry. And that includes government and academia as partners. But I'll give you just one example. So, ESIDs. Right? They're out there, some of our ECID on semiconductor devices. There are some semiconductor companies that already use them. There are some that don't. Um, a simple concept would be if we could make sure that those were actually published on an access control base so that we could go and look as OEMs who actually utilize those devices and see whether the ECID was actually utilized, number one then we could actually deploy internally in our own, granted here I go on supply chains, but on our own supply chains where, where we're actually deploying the right ESID from a forensic analysis perspective that gives us a lot of gain. Sounds really easy to do. That challenge is bringing an entire industry together. I was talking to Dr. Ross early this morning um, about something that he just read on LinkedIn uh, about me and we're talking about the challenge on STEM inside of New Hampshire. And the challenge is the teachers' unions. It's, it's not STEM education. So I, I think where you live is exactly where I live, which is we need to sit down together and say, what are the big things that we can do? And some of them might not be so big in the sense that they are tangible, ascertainable, and achievable. But we have political um, environments which allow us to face that challenge with real meaty discourse. And until we sit down and do that, we're never going to get over that IoT hurdle that you just articulated. So, okay, thanks. Um, so, Jim, I think this this next question is about uh, standards evolution. So we're going to send it to someone from a standards organization. Uh, so the cybersecurity threat evolves quickly, and Protection mechanisms evolve along with them. It's the old attacker defender arms race. Um, and standards take time to develop, particularly if you use a consensus process. Um, and uh, so, how do we change the dynamic? How do we make sure that the standards are keeping up with the evolving threat picture? Uh, and, you know, what more can be done to, to speed that up and keep it? Fresh. So I think uh, I'll go back to a series of workshops that we did in the fall around the topic of security automation. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the open group's perspective, I think standards development works best um, when you have a strong customer voice expressed around what are the, the pain points and the requirements and, uh, and issues. Uh, we did a series of workshops on the topic of security automation. Um, with uh, customer organizations, um, you know, we, we had maybe a couple hundred inputs over the course of four workshops, three, three physical events and one that we did on the web, um, collected that data and, and then are bringing it to the vendors and, and, you know, putting some context around a really critical area, which is how do you automate some of the security capabilities so that you are responding faster to, uh, to attacks and, and threats. So um, I think uh, you know, just generally, just the, the idea that we bring customers into the discussion early, we make sure that, that uh, their issues are well understood, um, that helps motivate the vendor community to get serious about doing things more quickly. Um, and I mean, one of the things we heard pretty clearly in terms of requirements was um, multi-vendor interoperability between security components uh, is pretty critical in that world. So. Um, you know, it's a multi-vendor world that most of the customers are living with, and uh, so, you know, building interfaces that are open um, where you've got interoperability between vendors is, is a really key thing. So, reactions? Rants? Uh, yeah, I think it's a really challenging problem because uh, in emerging technologies where you uh, want to encourage and you depend upon innovation, uh, it's hard to establish a standard. It's, it's still emerging. You don't know what is, what is going to be a good standard. So you hold off and you wait, and then you start to get, you get innovation, you get divergence, and then bringing it back together takes more energy, ultimately. Any, any others? No? Okay, good. 
So Rance, since you got the microphone, um, how much of the current cybersecurity situation is attributed to poor blocking and tackling in terms of the basics like, you know, doing security architecture, or even having a method to do security architecture? Um, things like risk management, which of course Jim uh, and the security forum have been looking into. Um, and not only that, translating that, that, that theory into operational practice and making sure that people are doing it on a regular basis. Uh, well, if I'm to um, believe a report I read on SANS that uh, there was a, a U.S. government issued report on January 20th of this year that um, many, or most, or all of our critical weapons systems uh, contain flaws and vulnerabilities. And one of the main conclusions of that, in many cases, it was due to not taking care of the basics, uh, the proper ad administration of systems, uh, the proper uh, application of uh, repairs, uh, patches, uh, vulnerability fixes, and so on. So uh, we need to be able to do it in, in critical systems as well as on desktops. I think we found um, in more research reports and other things about the, like for instance, what you might consider the open source code crisis that happened over the past year with um, Heartbleed and others to where the, the benefits of having that open source code is somewhat offset by the disadvantages of not everybody's looking to make it the, the right kind of quality or security for what your organization needs. So I think that's maybe one of the areas where the basics maybe need to, to be looked at. It's also because those systems were created in an environment when the threats and the, were in an entirely different level. And so that, that's a, a reminder that we need to look to that in our own organization. The other thing, like for instance, in the mobile um, applications where we have such a rush to get out features and the revs and everything like that, that it's not entirely embedded in the, the system's life cycle or, or in new startup companies. So I think those are some of the other basic areas where we find that the, the basics, the foundation yet needs to be solidified to really help enhance the security in those areas. Jim, did you have a question? I do. So, uh, you know, in the world of security, it can be a little bit opaque when you look at a given breach as to what really happened, what failed and so on, but um, enough information has come out about some of the breaches that you get some visibility into you know, what went wrong. Um, and I think of the two big insider breaches, um, uh, WikiLeaks and then Snowden. I mean, in both cases, there was fairly fundamental um, you know, security controls that should have been in place or maybe were in place but were poorly performed um, you know, that contributed to those, right? Uh, access control type things, authorization and so on. Um, even some of the large retailer credit card breaches, I think you can point to, you know, they didn't do certain things right um, in terms of the basic blocking and tackling. So I think a lot of it, is, there's a whole lot of security technology out there, a whole lot of security controls that you can look to, but implementing the right ones for your situation, given the risks that you have, and then operating them effectively, I think is uh, an ongoing challenge for most companies. Can I pose a question? Do you, do it's one of my premises that sometimes uh, compliance and regulation makes companies do things in the wrong areas to where they have a less security system. So what do you think about that and how that impacts the blocking and tackling? Well, I, I think that has probably been true for, say, the, you know, the four years preceding this. But I think uh, there was a study that I saw just recently. I couldn't tell you who it was from, but it basically flip that. It, for the last five years or so, compliance has always been at the top of the list of, you know, drivers for information security spend and projects and so forth. Uh, but it's dropped down considerably, I think because of all these high profile breaches and senior executive teams are, you know, just saying, okay, enough. <laughs> I don't care what, you know, the compliance regulations say, we're going to do the things we need to do to secure our environment. Nobody wants to be the next Sony. So. Or the the target CEO that had to step down, right? It's, even though they were compliant, they still had a breach, which right. unfortunately is is probably an opportunity at almost every enterprise and agency that's out there. Uh, and on the subject of open source, it's 
frequently uh, given as a justification or a, a benefit of open source that it will be more secure because there are millions of eyeballs looking at it. Uh, it's not millions of eyeballs, it's the right eyeballs uh, looking at it, the ones who can discern that there are security problems. So it is not necessarily the case that uh, open source is gonna be more secure because it can be viewed by millions of eyeballs. It's, uh, you can have proprietary software that has just as much or more attention from the right eyeballs as open source. And I think there's also those million eyeballs out there trying to make money on um, exploiting it before it does get patched. That's true, I mean, you know. The <clears throat> new market economy. Well, and I was just gonna mention, you know, that we're now seeing that, uh, uh, you know, some large companies are, are paying, paying those millions of eyeballs to go look for vulnerabilities, strangely enough, which they always find them in other people's code, not their own. Our zero day initiative, that was part of their um, business model is to pay people to find things that mm -hmm. we could implement into our own products first, but it also made it available to other companies and vendors so that they could fix it before it became public knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. But some of that economics is changing too, so that trying to get the, the, um, the white hatter, so to speak, to, to look at other parts that are maybe more critical like what came up with Harvard Lee. Uh, well, on that point, I'm gonna inject a question of my own, if I may. Um, you know, on balance, uh, is the open sharing of information of things like vulnerability analysis, um, is, that, is that helping move us forward, and can we do more of it, or you know, do we need to channel it in other ways? I, I think we need to do more of it. I think it is beneficial. We still have uh, conclaves of secretness around, you can give this information to this group of people but not this group of people. And it's very hard, like in my organization, which is global, I had to look at every last little detail to say, okay, can I share it with someone who's a foreigner? <laughs> or someone who's in my organization but not in my organization. It was really hard to try to figure out how we could uh, use that information more um, effectively and if we can get it more automated to where it doesn't have to be the good old boy network talking to someone else or an email or something like that I think it's more beneficial and it's not just the vulnerabilities it's also looking more towards um, threat intelligence you, you see a lot of investment you even saw it in uh, if you look at the details behind some of the investments in InQtel for instance about looking at data in a whole different way so we're emphasizing data, both in analytics as well as threat prediction, being able to perhaps know where something's gonna come over the hill and you can um, um, secure your enterprise or your applications or systems more effectively against it. Let's go down the row. Edna, what are your thoughts on more open sharing? So I, I think we need to do more of it, but I think we need to do it in a controlled environment. So for me, I think we can get ahead of the curve with um, not just predictive analysis, but telemetry to feed the predictive analysis. And that's not gonna happen because a government regulation mandates that we report somewhere. Um, so if you look at the new, for example, DFAR uh, that came out last year with regard to concerns about counterfeit mitigation and detection in COTS ICT, um, the reality is not everybody is a member of GUIDEP and many of us actually share our information faster than it gets into GuideUp um, and more comprehensively. So again, I'll go back to its rigor in the industry and sharing in a controlled environment. Jim, thoughts on open sharing? Um, good idea. Um, I, I think it gets a little murky when, you, when you're looking at uh, the uh, zero day vulnerabilities and um, you know, there's a whole kind of black market that's developed around those things uh, where nations are to some degree hoarding them, I think, um, paying a lot of money to get them, you know, to use them in cyber war type activities. There's a great book out now called uh, Zero Day by Kim Zetter, a writer from Wired um, that gets into the history of Stuxnet and, and how it was discovered and the semantic, and I forget the other security researcher firm that, that found it, but uh, there were a number of zero day vulnerabilities there um, you know, that were used in an offensive cyber war kind of uh, a capacity. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely a gray area at this point. 
and what also in dispute, I agree with what Edna said, um, the parameters of the controlled environment in which, uh, the controlled way in which it's done, without naming any names, uh, recently there were some feathers flying over a uh, security research organization uh, establishing some practices concerning a 60 or 90 day time frame in which they would notify a vendor of, uh, of vulnerabilities, giving them an opportunity to uh, issue a patch. And uh, in one instance recently, when that time expired and they released it, uh, the vendor was uh, rather upset because the patch had not been issued yet. So what, what is reason, what are reasonable parameters of this controlled environment? Let's uh, move on here. So Edna, one of the great quotes that came out of the early days of uh, OTTF was that, uh, that only God creates something from nothing and everybody else is on somebody's supply chain, uh, which I, I love that quote. Um, but given that all IT components, or all IT products are built from hardware and software components which are sourced globally, um, so what do we do to uh, mitigate the risks, specific risks resulting from um, malware and counterfeit parts being inserted in the supply chain? And how do you make sure that those, that the work to do that is reflected in creating preference for uh, vendors who, who, who put that effort into it? Yeah, so I, I think it's probably three-dimensional. I think the first part is understanding what your problem is. So if you go back to what we heard Marianne talk about, or Marianne Davidson talk about earlier today, uh, the reality is what's the problem you're trying to solve? And so I'll just use the, the trusted technology partner standard as an example of that, narrowing down what the problem is, where the problem is located, um, actually helps you, number one. And then I think you have to attack it from all dimensions, right? So it needs to be, we, we have a tendency to think about cyber in isolation from the physical, and the physical in isolation from the cyber. And then the logical, for those of us who live in OT or supply chain, we actually have to have processes that drive this. And if those three don't converge and map together, we will fail because there will be gaps, there will be inevitable gaps. And so for me, it's identifying what your true problem is and then taking a three-dimensional approach to make sure that you always have security technology, the combination of the physical security and then the logical processes to interlock and try and drive a mitigation scheme that will never reduce you to zero, but will identify things, particularly think about IoT in a manufacturing environment with the right sensor at the right time, telemetry around human behavior, all of a sudden you're gonna know things before they get to a stage in that supply chain or a product life cycle where they can become devastating in their scope of problem. Reactions? As, as one data point, uh, there was a lot of concern over uh, chips fabricated uh, in various parts of the world being used in national security systems. And in 2008, uh, DARPA initiated a program called TRUST, uh, which had a very challenging objective uh, for coming up with methods by which uh, these uh, chips could be validated uh, after manufacture. And just as one, one example of the outcome of that, uh, under the uh, IRIS program in 2010, um, SRI unveiled a uh, infrared uh, laser microscope that could actually examine the, the chips at the nanometer level, both for construction, functionality, and their uh, likely uh, lifetime, you know, how long they would last before they failed. Jim, Marianne, reactions? The only other thing I wanted to add to Edna's comment was reiteration about the economics of it and finding where the real problem is, um, especially in the security area, information um, technology security. We tend to get so focused on trying to make it technically pure, you know, you know, avoiding the most 100% ultimate risk, and sometimes we forget to put our business ears on and think about what does that really mean for the business? Is it keeping them from innovating quickly, um, adapting to new markets, perhaps um, getting into a new global environment? We really have to make sure we look back at the business imperatives and make sure that we have metrics all along the road that helps us make sure 
we're putting the investments in the right area because security is really a risk balance, which I know Jim has a whole lot more to talk about. Um, actually, the one thing I would add to this conversation is that um, is, uh, you know, we've sort of been on a journey to where uh, doing a better job of security is a good thing. Uh, the question is, when is it going to become a differentiator for your product and service uh, in the market, right? Um, and, you know, I know for me personally, uh, a bank that really gets online banking and security right, that's a differentiator to me as a consumer. Um, I saw a study from, uh, that was quoted this week at the World Economic Forum uh, that basically said uh, by a two to one margin, consumers, and they surveyed consumers in 27 countries, um, think that governments and businesses are not paying enough attention to digi digital security. So, you know, maybe that's a, a mind sh mindset shift that's occurring as a result of how bad cybersecurity has been. And maybe we, we will get to the point soon where uh, it can be a differentiator for companies, um, you know, in the business to business context and a business to consumer context and so forth. So we can hope, I think. Sorry, I must have been jiggling here. Okay. <laughs> so um, great point. And just, just to really pivot on that and point out how important it is. Um, I know that what we're seeing now, and it's a trend, and there are some cutting edge folks who have been doing it for a while, but most boards of directors are looking at creating a digital advisory board for their company. They're recognizing the pervasiveness of digital risk as its own risk that sometimes it reports up to the audit committee. Um, and so I've seen at least 20 or 30 in the last three months come around looking for digital advisory board members to focus on this from multiple disciplines. If we get that right, um, it might allow us that opportunity to actually share the information more broadly. Yeah, Th that's a really interesting point, that the point about multiple disciplines. And uh, I think the next question, and, and unfortunately the final question, or fortunately since we'll get you to lunch, I'm going to start rant with, off with rants. Um, at some point, the, um, the difference between a security vulnerability failure or other kinds of failures um, all flow into that big risk analysis that, you know, a, uh, a digital risk management regime would, would find out. And so one of the things that's going on, of course, in the real-time embedded systems forum is to look at how we architect uh, systems for higher levels of assurance, not just security vulnerabilities, but other kinds of failures uh, as well. So, I guess the question I'll, I'll ask here, um, you know, uh, if, if a system fails its SLA for whatever reason, whether it's security or some other kind of vulnerability, um, is that um, a result of our, our ability to do system architecture uh, or software created without provably secure or provably assured components or the ability of the system to react to those kind of failures? And if you believe that, how do we change it? How do we accelerate the adoption of better practices in order to, you know, to mitigate the whole spectrum of, of risks of, of failure of the digital uh, enterprise. Well, thanks for that complicated question with zero minutes uh, <laughs> remaining on the That's clock. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, shall add, we shall add four <laughs> minutes to the clock. In summary. Uh, well, in the high assurance systems, obviously, we still treat as very important detection of uh, problems when they occur, uh, recovery from problems, but we have put a greater emphasis on prevention, and we try to put a greater eff effort into prevention. You mentioned uh, provably secure components, but uh, provable security is only uh, part of the picture. When you do a proof, you prove a theorem, and uh, in a reasonable system, a, a system of reasonable complexity, there isn't just one theorem. There are uh, tens, hundreds, or even thousands of theorems that are proved to establish certain uh, properties of the system. And it has to do with proofs of the various parts, proofs of how the parts combine, uh, what are the claims we want to make for the system, how do the proofs provide evidence that the claims are justified, and what kind of argumentation do we use based on that, uh, that set of evidence? And so we're, we're looking at uh, not just the proofs as 
little gems, if you will. You know, a, a proof of a theorem is a little, think of it as a, a gemstone. But, but how they're all combined uh, into creating the system. If a, um, if a movie star walked out on the red carpet with a little burlap sack around her neck full of a handful of gemstones, we wouldn't uh, be so as impressed as we are when we see a, a beautiful uh, necklace that's been done by a real uh, master who's taken tens or hundreds of stones and combined them in a very pleasing and beautiful way. And so we have to put as much attention not just on the individual gemstones, which admittedly are created with very uh, pure materials and under great pressure, um, but also how they're combined into a, into a work that uh, meets, meets the purpose. And so we have assurance cases, we have uh, compositional reasoning, and other things that have to come into play. It's, it's not just about the provable components, and it's a mistake that is sometimes made to just focus on the, the proof. Remember, proof is really just a degree of demonstration. Mm -hmm. And we always want some demonstration to have confidence in the system. And, and proof is just a, an, an extreme degree of demonstration. Perhaps. Jim? Uh, yeah, some, someone else? Huh? I think I would summarize it by embedding security early and often and don't depend on 100%. That means you have to make your systems, your processes, and your people resilient. Edna, Jim? Good, Jim? No? We're good? Okay, well, it's a very interesting panel. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Marianne Masapella from uh, Hewlett Packard, Edna Conway from Cisco, Jim Hytella, our VP of Security for the Open Group, and Rance DeLong from Santa Clara University. Thank you very much.